The next couple of weeks, we'll, we'll have presentations by people from our own institute. So they'll probably, most of them will be in person. Uh, the first person in that series is uh, Enrique Vasquez de Madrid. Um, Enrique got his PhD from the University of Texas, where he worked on turbulence and molecular clouds with uh, John Scalo. Since then, he has been a CUNA, um, where he was also director of the Institute between 2015 and 2019. He's an expert in the formation, growth, and dynamics of electric clouds, and has also worked a lot on turbulence since his PhD. Um, today, he's going to tell us a little bit about uh, new ways to look at spherical gravitation collapse. So, thank you. So, you said uh, I can take my mask off? Okay. Yeah. Right, yeah. We will We will keep them on. Uh, I guess I'll speak in English, right? Uh, it's all you. Yeah. Perfect. Good. Well, fantastic. This is the first, uh, also, it's my first colloquium in real, uh, in person since more than two years ago. So, that's great. And yes, I'm going to be talking about what we have been learning. Uh, about spherical gravitational collapse, because it turns out that you learn a lot by going back to the old papers and looking at them with, uh, you know, with the vision that you acquire after 30 something years of working on, in this business. And um, so I'll first, uh, well, this is a list of my collaborators as usual. They are all from here, or they eventually, they were at some point here, Gilberto, Ruben is one of my students. Robert Loveman was my postdoc before. Raul Naranjo, same thing. Uh, well, Raul Naranjo was my grad student at Palau, you know very well. And Manuel Zamora, who is now at Inaue. And so, how am I going to, uh, how am I going to do this? Um, the the basic idea behind this talk is that, of course, now we have super sophisticated numerical simulations, and uh, and so sometimes you could go, oh, why look back at spherical collapse? Well, because it, that's where the theory started. Uh -huh. And much of our interpretation of uh, numerical simulations today is still somehow based or at least oriented or guided by what we learned from the old uh, models of, of spherical collapse. So we can understand fundamental processes, the interactions uh, between the various uh, physical agents, identify biases, uh, this is very important. I will be mentioning a few. And then, so uh, with this uh, philosophy in mind, I'll first go and, and revisit uh, the theory of, uh, of spherical collapse, and in particular, the inside-out collapse model by Shu. Uh, and then uh, I will present a, a model, or an evolutionary model for the pre-stellar stage of collapse that, that we published last year. And uh, among this, uh, I'll talk about the approach to an R to the minus two density profile, uh, slope for the density profile. Uh, the, interestingly, the gravitationally unbound nature of, nature of a central part of, of, the, of any collapse. And then the analogy with the magnetic support case. So let's go and, and revisit uh, the inside out collapse model. And much of this discussion has been um, put in, in a couple of papers. One is our paper, our summary paper of, our, uh, of the global hierarchical collapse model that we're promoting. And the other one is a paper precisely on, uh, on the model that I'll show later. But we also gave some of this discussion here. So in, back in 1977, so, uh, like 45 years ago or something like that, uh, Frank Schutt proposed the famous inside-out uh, collapse model. And for doing this, he, has, he made an, a number of assumptions because you, when you solve the equations, you need to make a few assumptions uh, in order to set up your boundary conditions, to know which terms you can uh, neglect, and so on and so forth. So uh, the first assumption he made was that the pre-stellar evolution had to occur quasi-statically. Uh, so, why, why did he assume this? Because he noted already that um, the density profiles in simulations, and I don't know if at the time, at that time we had enough observations, but certainly in er early simulations, for example, by Larson and so on, uh, they had an R to the minus two density profile at, the, at least in the envelope of the core. And so, by analogy with von Ehrlich spheres, where you have a, 
a hydrostatic uh, solution to the to to the uh, to the hydro equations, you realize that in order to set up the uh, the configuration, the density structure, you need to construct it by setting up uh, detailed pressure equilibrium at every radius. And so, in order to uh, to be able to attain pressure balance at every radius. Uh, it is needed that the information is able to propagate before the structure collapses on you. So he assumed that everything, all the motions had to be subsonic so that pressure had time to balance and, and to, uh, to equalize pressures at every rate. Mm -hmm. Then the other assumption he made was the dynamical collapse started from some equilibrium structure, which he thought could be an unstable one sphere. So you take a bottom orbit sphere, an unstable one, you give it a little kick, and then it begins collapsing. But in particular, he thought of one very specific uh, bottom orbit sphere, which is the singular isothermal sphere. The singular isothermal sphere, like the name indicates, has a singularity at the center. And having a singularity at the center, meaning the density diverges at the center, it has a straight uh, r to the minus two profile everywhere from from r equals to zero to r equals to infinity. When when the, your initial condition for the collapse is an as a singular isothermal sphere, then he realized that the collapse starts at the center, of, uh, because that's the highest density. Uh, and so this is a plot of the solutions for the for the infill speed uh, versus the non-dimensional radio uh, uh, coordinate, which is actually normalized by the time. So this is what's called the similarity variable. Um, so uh, as time goes on, the anything in this axis propagates outwards uh, in order to keep this constant. So this is a plot of both the radial and the temporal uh, solution to the problem. And so what he found is that the collapse initiates at the center so that the velocity diverges at the center, also the density diverges at the center. Then it propagates outwards at the sound speed. Um, and so there's a certain radius uh -huh, uh, at which the velocity becomes zero. So the, there's a, uh, an expanding rarefaction front uh, inside of which the, the gas is infalling to the center and outside of which the material is at rest. And so this is the famous inside out solution. And it has become essentially the collapse paradigm. It's important to note that it corresponds to the protostellar stage because it starts out when you already have a, a singularity and the density. So you, the density has already diverged. So essentially you're it's the moment when you form a zero mass star, and then the, the, after that, the, ma the, the central star continues to accrete material. Mm -hmm. So it's the time, the, the initial uh, condition is the time of the formation of the protostar. However, it is hard to imagine that the entire pre-stellar collapse could occur quasi statically. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, unstable binary spheres are unstable which means that if you take any Bonnerby sphere, and there's a range of Bonnerby spheres long before you reach the singular isothermal sphere, so that means with, set, with final central densities, there's a whole range of unstable Bonnerby spheres, which means that uh, the, you, you can start with a, with a non-singular Bonnerby sphere, what's called a regular, with a final central density that's already unstable, so you kick it, and it goes into dynamical collapse. So you cannot traverse a, a sequence, a quasi-statically traverse a sequence of one orbit spheres. As soon as you have a, an unstable configuration, the moment you perturb it, it goes into dynamical collapse, not hydrostatic collapse. Uh, furthermore, more, the, the singular isothermal sphere is the most unstable of all those unstable spheres. So you do not expect it to occur uh, spontaneously in nature. Uh, you don't expect unstable equilibria to appear. You don't expect to see this thing standing up on its, on its foot. Mm -hmm. And moreover, uh, in, like, four years ago, uh, Wang Xing Li, uh, then in Heidelberg, published a very interesting paper where he showed that the R to the minus two density profile arises simply as a consequence 
of the velocity in spherical geometry, of the velocity being the gravitationally driven velocity, so uh, on the order of square root of gm squared over r, under uh, the condition that the accretion rate is independent of radius, so that the mass is flowing uh, continuously across radii, and, uh, and you don't lose or gain any mass in the, in the, in the tr uh, tr uh, in, along the way. Mm -hmm. So this suggests that the r to the, r to the minus 2 density profile may not require detailed pressure balance to be established, like Dr. Shu has suggested. Also, it has been invoked, magnetic support has been invoked as a means to maintain the clouds in hydrostatic equilibrium uh, with, the slow con with the cloud contracting slowly as a con uh, uh, just because of ambipolar diffusion. So the, the magnetic flu flux diffuses out uh, slowly and then your clouds can contract. But the problem with that is that it does not preserve, preserve spherical geometry. The clouds flatten when you have magnetic support. So your entire magnetic, um, spherically symmetric model goes down the drain when you assume magnetic support. And then also the magnetic support is similar to the thermal pressure support in the sense that uh, if you allow the magnetic flux to be diffused away by ambipolar diffusion or maybe other kinds like Alex Lazarian is advocating reflection diffusion, uh, it will go on into dynamical collapse long before you have formed the singularity. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to wait until your density is infinite to decouple uh, from the magnetic field. It typically happens. And there were big fights between Muscovias and Shu at what density uh, the, the, the gas decoupled from the magnetic field, but it certainly is not infinite. So it was more like 10 to the, from 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 9 or something. Mm -hmm. Then there's turbulent support, which is also imposed. But turbulent support is not hydrostatic by definition. People used to imagine turbulence as an, just as a sort of an additional tur uh, temperature so that you have more support than just temperature will give you. But that's not turbulence. Turbulence is motions, is large scale motions. It's not microscopic. And in fact, the largest, uh, this, the largest motions occur at the largest scales. So really, it does not provide support for the clouds. It, you can think of it more as a distortion of the, of the cloud or a core or a cloud. Mm -hmm. So it's a turbulent core in our modern, modern understanding of turbulence is not just a core with an additional pressure. It's a, a shaking core. Mm -hmm. And besides, if a core is formed by, now we know that molecular clouds are turbulent. So, and, and the standard notion is that cores are formed by turbulence, so turbulent compressions. But if a core is formed by a turbulent compression, how would it first equilibrate and then disequilibrate again? Or you know, so it, it would have to go up and then continue. And we know, we know that that doesn't happen. For example, if you have a ball going uphill and then going downhill again, Either it comes back or it goes downhill, but it doesn't stay at the top. Mm -hmm. So uh, you don't expect this to happen. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and finally, turbulence involves a continuous energy cascade from the large scales. So it's, it's not like you inject turbulence, turbulence into a core and then wait for it to decay like many simulators do. But actually, there is a connection to the larger scales, which are feeding continuously energy into this object. And so there's no reason for, for the formation. Perhaps there is, if you assume a core forms by, by a shock, uh -huh. but, uh, but in, in that case, the, uh, the shock, sorry, the, the core will form after the dissipation has occurred. Uh, sorry, the core. You dissipate energy at the shock, then form the core. Mm -hmm. And so once you have the core, the energy has already dissipated, not like people imagine it, that you somehow inject the energy into the core and then let it decay and, and let the core collapse. That's not the way it happens when you form a, a dense structure by a, by a shock. The dissipation occurs at the shock front and the density is the gas post, is the post shock gas. Okay, so that's not how turbulence works. So our conclusion is the pre stellar evolution should occur dynamically, at least during part of its evolution, not quasi static. That is, the singularity must be rich dynamic. And there is no reason for the cores to undergo a hydrostatic stage if, if, if they live in a turbulent molecular cloud. Mm -hmm. If you accept this, actually, Shu had the solution also for this. Mm -hmm. 
Shu uh, computed both the, uh, the inside out collapse solution, but many others. And in fact, he didn't uh, exhaust the range of possibilities, but he got solutions that are probably more relevant to, to what we observe in simulations, for example. This, like I showed before, is the singular, uh, is the inside out collapse solution. But these are other solutions for which the initial condition was not the singular isothermal sphere, but rather an earlier stage uh, unstable vulnerable sphere. So that is a vulnerable sphere with a finite central density. You perturb it, you let it go, and then by the time it forms a singularity, the rest of the material is already falling in, much beyond the point where the rarefaction front would be in the, in the inside out solution. Mm -hmm. So by the time the singularity, which is the protostar, forms, the material is already falling in from long distances. And today we know this as clump fed accretion. It's not just the core that is collapsing. The, the, the gas is coming in from larger scales, and uh, this has been observed, and it's termed, normally termed clump fed accretion. It's not just the core, but the clump inside of which is uh, our core is. And, uh, and so there is no hydrostatic envelope if the initial condition is not a singular isothermal sphere. Uh, more complete solutions were obtained by Whitworth and Summers in 1985, and they basically exhausted the range of possible uh, types of initial conditions that you could have. And um, what is very important is that the density and velocity profiles during the pre-stellar stage are qualitatively very different from those of the pre protostellar stage. So here's the, the, my favorite plot from that paper. This, uh, and this is a plot showing uh, the most typical uh, kinds of solutions. And it shows both the pre-stellar solution and the protostellar solution. The pre-stellar solution is uh, uh, shown by the solid lines. And, you, and this is the density. So it's flat at the center, uh, and then it has this, an r to the minus 2 slope in the envelope. Mm -hmm. While uh, the velocity is flat outside and then drops in to, towards the center, like linearly with r. So this goes like r. Which means that during the pre-stellar stage, the velocity at the center does not diverge, like in the, in, in the inside-out collapse model. Rather, it goes to 0. Mm -hmm. Now, the protostellar solution uh, occurs at the moment of formation of the singularity, because again, this is the, uh, the time, oh, sorry, I'm signaling here and people cannot see it. Uh, that could project me, right? But this coordinate is, is the singularity variable, and this coordinate involves the time, so, which means that as time and, and oh, I didn't mention, this, the full solution involves the convention that the pre-stellar stage refers to negative times, and the protostellar stage refers to positive times, with t equals zero being the moment of the protostellar formation, of the protostellar formation, of the, of the occurrence of the singularity at the center. So if, when you come from minus infinity to zero, that, that's uh, actually this should have a, a, sorry, an absolute value here, I forgot about that. But when you're coming from, from minus infinity to zero, then uh, the time, the magnitude of the time is, is, going, is becoming smaller. So this coordinate, uh, in order to maintain this finite, you need to go to more inner radii, which means that as, as time goes from minus infinity to zero, this bend here and this bend here of the, of the velocity solution falls into the center. Mm -hmm. We will see actually numerical solutions showing just that in a, in a short way. But what this means is that this, this profile over time is coming to the center, is in falling into the center. So that's outside a collapse rather than inside out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and this is, these are the, the shapes of the, uh, of the of this density and velocity uh, profiles both in the inner part and the outer part, the inner core and the envelope. Mm -hmm. And note that the, during, during the pre-stellar stage, the, uh, the, yeah, I should be marking with this, the velocity goes to zero at the center. Mm -hmm. 
But it's very important to note the similarity of the pre-stellar density profile to the Bonner Ebert sphere. If the Bonner Ebert sphere is also flat at the center, and then it has an R to the minus two envelope at large, uh, at large uh, radii, which means that contrary to what many people assume, a Bonner Ebert like uh, profile, something that looks like a Bonner Ebert, does not necessarily imply that you are in hydrostatic equilibrium. You can just be in the pre stellar stage of collapse. Now, uh, although, the, sorry, the solution here uh, seems to suggest that during the pre stellar stage, the velocity remains constant out to infinite distances, that's only when you assume. Uh, that as an initial condition, but if you assume that at some large radius the velocity is zero, then the solution is just like that. So it reaches a maximum and then it comes back down at side. And then this is exactly what we see, for example, in a simulation of, uh, of, of a core forming inside a much larger simulation of molecular cloud formation, the, the kind of simulations we you know we do. Uh, of converging flows forming a large molecular cloud. And this is a core uh, who's doing a zoom in into the simulation. Uh -huh. And then uh, what you see, for example, these are the two different times in the simulation. Uh, and you see that, and the three uh, lines are the velocity profiles along the three axes. And you see that the core is more or less here at x, uh, x, x y, z equals to zero. And then the velocity reaches relatively large values, and then it comes back down out. Mm -hmm. So it happens in, in all dimensions. Mm -hmm. So that's what you should expect in, in general for the course. You should expect a, the, the velocity going to zero at the center, it increasing more or less linearly with radius over some distance, reaching a maximum and then coming back down. Okay, and that, so that's our uh, re reading of the papers. Actually, there's nothing new. It's just that our memory as a community it has been somewhat selective. And, and so we have selected the inside out collapse solution as a paradigm. But really, the full solutions have been there all the time. Mm -hmm. And it, it was just a matter of, uh, of understanding the thing and going back and trying to figure out why the simulations look like they do. Mm -hmm. So now, what happens when we, you have one of these collapses and you observe it synthetically? And this is now new work uh, that I'm doing with Robert Glockman, who was um, a postdoc. Now, uh, now he doesn't have a job in astronomy, but he's, he's still here in Morelia and he's teaching, but uh, he's still doing, have finding time to, to do astronomy. And so what happens when you uh, observe one of these? Well, the decrease of the infall, infall speed towards the center during the pre stellar stage may have some implications because we normally interpret if these um, in the oops we normally interpret them like in this figure by Evans uh, in 1999 this is an annual reviews by by Neil Evans and so the paradigm is the inside out collapse so you have an infalling in a region and a static envelope and that and then you assume that the the spectral lines formed in the, this type of core, uh, assuming this type of structure, are created by, in, in this way. You have uh, an inner core, uh, which is infalling with the velocity increasing towards the center. So the largest velocities are forming uh, these peaks. There's a, a, a blue shifted um, peak. Let me, yeah, let me show you. There's a blue shifted peak here which is uh, coming from the far side of the core, and a red peak, which is coming from the near side of the core. Now, however, this is in optically thick lines. Now, if the line is optically thick, you always tend to see the near side of whatever uh, you're looking at. So, for example, if you're looking at, notice that because there's a velocity difference, this part of the core shows up in uh, in the red shifted side, so it's an, um, uh, a response to this big peak, and the the far part of the core comes uh, and corresponds to the left side of the peak. But if the line is optically thick and you assume that these velocities are too different, then what happens is that you observe the lower density part of the core, and therefore uh, you sample the lower uh, you sample this side uh, more than you sample this side. This, this side, 
this inner part of the near side of the core, uh, of the near side of yeah, the core, is somehow obscured by the near side of the core. And the opposite happens here. The far part of the, of, uh, of the far, uh, the far section of the far part of the core is partly obscured by, by this, uh, by the inner part of, of the far side. <laughs> it's kind of uh, uh, complicated, but what that means is that you are going to see a, a higher excitation temperature uh, for the far side because you have a higher density here uh, and you, you're going to see a lower excitation temperature uh, for the near side because you're seeing the lower density part of the core. And that's what gives you this asymmetric uh, uh, line profile. But now this is assuming a shoe inside out profile, which has zero, uh, which has zero speed outside. Uh -huh. Oh, and then this absorption dip in the middle comes from the static envelope that's outside. Mm -hmm. That's the interpretation. But if you assume a pre the density and velocity profile, then the interpretation is different. Now, the, self, the, the dip in the middle must be made by the densest uh, 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 part of the core because it's the only part that, uh, that is at zero velocity. The rest of the core is infalling. So this dip must be made by self-absorption in the middle, in the center of the core. And then uh, the other parts are uh, produced in a similar way, essentially. But now there is a possibility that uh, the highest velocity is somewhat undersampled because the density is already coming down at the outer part of the core. In the previous uh, image, the maximum velocity occurs at the center, which is where the highest densities are. But in this picture, the highest velocities occur when the density is already coming back down a little bit. So this gave us an idea that perhaps can resolve one of the final problems that uh, our model of hierarchical collapse has to meet, which is the, the fact that observations suggest that the collapse is mm, transonic, subsonic, it's very, it, it's very quiescent. Mm -hmm. While in the simulation, it, that's not the case. Uh -huh. uh, let me just bring this. It distracts me. It's okay. So uh, let's see what we set out to set out to do was observe this uh, this type of systems uh, with synthetic observations. So we considered two cores uh, from numerical simulations. One uh, published by Raúl Naranjo uh, in 2015. It's an ideal an idealized spherical core is during the pre-stellar stage, but it's perfectly spherical. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. and it's a, a spherical perturbation sitting on top of a uniform density background. Mm -hmm. And the other one is the, the same core that I was showing you before. Uh, I'll show you images of the core soon. Uh, so this is exactly the same core I was showing, and this is at two, two different times. As you can see, this is what I was saying. The velocity maximum, the, these curves, this, these are plots of the velocity in units of the sound speed uh, as a function of the radius. And then uh, uh, the, the different curves uh, depict different times. So the, the core is evolving in this direction. You can see that the maximum velocity is approaching the center. Mm -hmm. So at earlier times, the maximum velocity is over here, maybe, you know, up here at maybe 0.1 parsecs from the center, but at later times, the maximum velocity is almost near the center. And that's why the, you, so, you have a sudden change in the, in the density and velocity profiles, because when the velocity maximum hits the center from both sides, you have a shock. And shocks change, give you a change in, 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 the, in the regime. Mm -hmm. So uh, at the moment of this, uh, when the two uh, ma velocity maxima hit the center, you shock there, and then you form a singularity, the density diverges, and after that, your regime uh, changes. And after that, the velocity peaks at the center rather than peaking at outside. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, and the same thing happens here, except with a lot of noise and uh, asymmetries, because this is not, uh, uh, this is not spherically symmetric. But, uh, but as you can see, the pattern is qualitatively similar. 
And then what we did is we used a standard or you know any tool of uh, uh, measuring or deriving the info velocity from the profiles. And we chose in particular the Hill 5 model from a paper by De Vries and Myers in 2005. Uh, for example, this is the classical two-layer model that one uses uh, to infer velocities from, from the uh, line profiles. Uh, they try to do it with a slightly more refinement and they, they assumed rather than just two, two layers, they assumed like a, a, an, uh, a, a rising density towards the center. And so that's why they called it the, it the hill model. So the, this is like a little hill. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't have time to go into the details. In fact, I don't understand them very well. But <laughs> we just took their um, their uh, method and applied it to the course. And so we made the synthetic observations and then we got the profiles and then analyzed the profiles with this method. And uh, so, for example, this is the line profile for the for the spherical core. We observe it in HCO plus at the in two transitions, J uh, equals three to two, which is optically still optically thick, because we, we, we've been finding out that this core is a little bit too dense uh, compared to real, real cores. Uh, and then an optically thin line, which, which is the uh, still HCO plus, but J423. Uh, and so this is the line profile. And we observe, for example, at this particular time in the evolution, uh, actually we observe it at many different times, but this shows this particular time which is, uh, is relatively early in the evolution of the core. It's, it's here. But you can see then what's interesting to note is that the fact that this is the velocity that the algorithm retrieves, the info speed that the algorithm retrieves, about 0.1 kilometers per second. While at this, uh, uh, at this time, the real info velocity in the core is about 0.17. It's still subsonic but it's already, you know, like 70% larger. Mm -hmm. The realistic core, and finally here I'm showing it, and uh, so we got to, to, to do uh, like these grids of spectra like uh, the observers do, and I, I felt like I had yeah, finally done something like the observers, but, uh, well, I did it. it, it was Robert who did it, but anyway. Uh, so this is the realistic core. This is not as dense, so we used Still the HCO plus, but in J equals one to zero and, and uh, uh, three to two, and these are optically thick. Oh, sorry. Uh, so I think the, not the three to two, but the, and still we use the, the four to three. The fact is that these, this is the grid of spectra over a rectangle covering the, uh, covering the core. Uh, this is the J equals one to zero transition, and this is the J equals three to two transition. So yeah, we, we did observe both. And this is what the, what the uh, spectrum looked like. It's very interesting because as uh, Rowan Smith has pointed out in some paper about 10 years ago, the fact that the, the whole thing is not spherically symmetric actually messes up the ideal, uh, uh, oh, come on, <laughs> the ideal uh, uh, blue shiftedness, uh, sorry, blue uh, skewed nature of the profile. And in many times, you see uh, profiles that look almost the same, or even uh, even with a little bit of a red excess. But in many cases, especially in the um, Robert tells me that he thinks that here basically we're being obscured by the filament outside of the core. But uh, when we use a a higher transition, uh, then the the signature of the collapse is rather clear. Mm -hmm. And then this is the info speed that comes in. This is from the J equals one to zero, and this is from the three to two. And again, this is the info speed. Now, uh, and this is the radial profile of the info speed. We used like a pencil beam. Um, but look, this is the maximum info speed that you get when, when your beam goes to the center, and it returns a velocity of about 4.8 kilometers per second compared to the actual info speed, which is about 0.45. So there's like a factor of three difference here in the, uh, between the true info speed and the derived info speed. And our thinking, this is yet still work in progress, but we're thinking that this is due to the different shape of the, uh, 
of the velocity, the density and velocity profiles, so that when the maximum, uh, the, velo the gas with the maximum velocity doesn't have the maximum density. So it's not, it doesn't get so much weight in the profile, and therefore your peaks occur closer to the center than uh, than what represents the true velocity. Can I add something? Yes, yes, sure. I think uh, I think I have mentioned this before. Um, I, I agree with your conclusion, but uh, also taking mm -hmm. the difference between reality and inference as as a maximum versus derived might be a little bit of an excess. No, I mean you are taking there uh, the maximum inference speed, no? Whereas yeah. probably to take a reference in the simulation, probably you should take something like a density average. That is probably true. in the simulation, no? And probably the results will be closer. Okay, yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, the thing is, but really, then there you have the problem is, what is the real impulse speed? There's no one single impulse speed, really. And you could think that, uh, the, the, you see, the fact that it's supersonic, it's already violating Frank Hsu's assumptions at the beginning. And, and the, ex the excuse for that was that actually the velocities were, inferred speeds were subsonic. But that's not really the case, at least not throughout the core. Okay. Yeah. That's that's a big point. But I, I get I take your point. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, besides what uh, Roberto just said, but there's a systematic underestimation, at least with respect to the maximum impulse speed in the in the core, and uh, and so that means that pre-stellar cores. Oh come on, maybe more dynamic than estimated by standard methods, or at least we're not so constrained to have subsonic info for the pre stellar cores as is often the argument uh, uh, in favor of this quasi static early stage mm -hmm. so uh, that's as far as, as we go in this part and then in the last section i'd like to talk to you about the, this non-similar pre stellar evolution uh, because this is also very interesting what we what we found is that um well most studies have been done uh, using similarity techniques mm -hmm. and the similarity techniques uh, construct a non-dimensional variable so that uh, it like i said before your diagram your solution represents the solution both in space and time at the, uh, at the same time but uh, but that does not apply to transients when when your system is adjusting from the initial conditions to to something that is more or less self-similar in time. And so what happens during the very early stages of collapse, and in particular during the pre stellar stage, when, you, when your core separates from the cloud uh, flow and begins to collapse, whatever you mean by that, because we don't know exactly where the core ends, but at least we have established that the info uh, motions extend further out that than the classical rarefaction front uh, of the inside out solution. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a, a, a study that aims to understand the aims at understanding what happens during these early stages and how do you build up? If you start with just a moderate density fluctuation, how does it build up to the point where it's ready to form a star? Mm -hmm. How does it grow? And so what we did is we assumed that uh, these are, for example, the famous uh, plots from Larson's 1969 paper. And uh, here again, there's the, the solution uh, as a function of time. This is the density profile in log log. And this is what, I, what we said. This is an R to the minus two. And then there's a central flat top that, uh, that, get, that shrinks as time goes on until it becomes uh, of zero radius and at that point you have formed a singularity so what we did is we assumed that there's a background so that this does not extend as r to the minus two to the infinity so but rather there's a, a background in, and then so this is the background mm -hmm. we we say that this is the background density so this one doesn't change and then we just draw a single power law from the background density to the peak density and let it evolve in time. So this is an approximation, but it, but it allowed us to, to get some solutions. And so the, the slope is evolving. Mm -hmm. Pre presumably, it will evolve towards the, the value of minus two, which you see uh, being the asymptotic solution at large distances. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so what we did is the same thing as Lee did in his, in his 2018 paper, assume that the velocity is the gravitational velocity square root of g m over r, mm -hmm. and uh, that the density is just some power law density profile, r to the minus p, where p can, is allowed to be a function of time. So we introduced these two in the continuity equation, and then we were able to obtain an evolution equation for, for p, for the exponent. Uh -huh. And here's the solution. It's, it looks messy, but actually, all of this is positive definite. So uh, these are like correction factors, but what gives you the sign of this derivative is this factor here, is 3 minus 3p over 2, which is interesting because this becomes 0 at uh, p equals 2. Mm -hmm. And so what you find is that if p is larger than 2, then the derivative is negative. Mm -hmm. While if p is less than 2, then the, the derivative is positive, which means that p is an attractor. That is, the slope wants to go to, to the value of, of uh, p equals 2. Uh -huh. Oops. Uh, and, and then this reinforces the, the result from, from Lee saying that the, the, the slope of 2 arises just from spherical freefall not from detailed pressure balance. Mm -hmm. And that p equals 2, the accretion rate is independent of radius, because that's exactly what uh, it, it turns out. If you work out the, the accretion rate, you also find that it is, in, in, it is independent of radius. Also very interesting, and we have discussed this before, I mentioned this in the previous talk here, is that if p is less than 2, then you find out that the accretion rate is larger at larger radii, which means that somehow the, the, the core is not being able to transfer all the mass it receives from, the, it, from its surroundings to the central stars. It accumulates gas, mm -hmm. which means it allows the, well, I can't find my cursor, it is here. Uh -huh. it, it, so less gas goes to the center than, go, than enters out the outside. So the core can grow. This is very interesting because this gives us a mechanism for core growth without any form of support. Uh -huh. This is what's Interesting. It's just gravity doing its best, but it's still not able to transfer all of the mass to the center. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, probably this is where models like the Ulrich flow become useful, no? Because uh, there is the other way. The problem is that these models are spherical, no? Mm -hmm. Whereas in models like the Ulrich flow, you have thing, you have essentially a constant accretion rate, and you have a density that varies with with the with the angles mm -hmm. of, the, of the flow. No? Okay. It's like the the other way around, no? Yeah, actually, what we're doing... The flow is preserved, but the density varies with... Uh, as, as well. Which we're trying to do, because we know this is an idealization. Uh -huh. So what we're doing now is... Now, let's imagine that what matters... It's not exactly correct, but if we imagine that what matters is the potential... Uh, is the spherically average gravitational potential, excuse me, for what's outside, then you can work out your average. And so what we are doing now is, uh, well, actually, Gilberto already computed it. Uh, what happens when you have like a filament of constant density uh, embedded in, 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 the, in the volume? And indeed, it works out to give you a net uh, spherically averaged uh, slope less than minus two, sharp, shallower than minus two. And so, yeah, we, we're trying to understand, because if this is a good mechanism to, for the course to grow and uh, accumulate mass, we want to understand how it can happen when it's not spherically symmetric. And we're thinking that pre precisely the presence of filaments is what, on average, uh, makes the slope a little bit shallower. Mm -hmm. Because in the paper, we, all, we did find, find that uh, most observed reported slopes you know, tend to be less than minus two, yes. slightly less than minus two. Yeah, okay. and, and that's perfect, because then it allows the course to grow. Yeah. And which is in perfectly in line with our idea of an evolutionary system. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, like, and like I said, there's no need for any form of support. It's just that gravity cannot work faster than that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh -huh. And that's it. Okay. Uh, where, where am I? Can I see? Uh -huh. Okay. The other very interesting thing is that. If you have a power law with, a, with an arbitrary slope of minus p, then the gene's length scales like this thing here. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, it goes like r to the p over 2. So if p is less than 2, 
then the gene's length decreases uh, with decreasing radius mm -hmm, more slowly than R itself, than the radius itself. And so you have a situation like uh, I schematically drew in this plot. So you, this is the radius. And so this is a plot of the radius and the, and the gene's length versus the radius. The radius, of, of course, the identity line, but the gene's length is a line like this. So it, even if you have a multi-gene's length object at large scales, the inner parts always look like they have a radius smaller than the gene's length, which means that, uh, uh, and not only that, the, the gene-stable region shrinks over time. Uh -huh. So for example, this is at the beginning, uh, sometime later, sometimes later. And so this genes, uh, genes, apparently gene-stable region is shrinking over time. So the whole region is contracting. It's contracting even though it's gene stable. How, why is it gene stable? Because it's being crushed by, I never know whether it's crushed or crunched, but it's being compressed by, by the material falling on, onto it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that means that if the, if the slope is less than minus, is shallower than minus two, there's always a region that appears gene stable, even the if the entire cloud is gene unstable. And so we like to say that the, the region is not pressure confined, but rather grand pressure compressed. And this can explain, for example, the, uh, the observations from Charlie Dada and his co-workers in 2008, where they were looking at cores, a, a, a cores in the pipe, uh, in this diagram of the mass divided by the, by the bonner ebert mass, which is similar to the genes mass, versus the core, core mass. And so in this, in this diagram, uh, the value of unity separates the unstable cores from the stable cores. Mm -hmm. And what, uh, what they found is that both, that the entire sequence of course seems to form just a, a single family. Mm -hmm. in, in Raoul's paper in 2015, we follow the evolution of a single core and we uh, define just uh, as defining its boundary just by a certain as, uh, by means of a cer certain uh, threshold above the background density because like i mentioned we had a background density and so defining the core like that which is more or less observation observationally inspired then we notice that the core precisely tracks the the uh the locus uh, of, of these cores and this sort of makes sense because if you just look at at charlie's uh plot then you wonder why in the world do the stable cores lie in the same locus as the unstable cores? Because once are stable, they, they just want to remain there, while the others are collapsing, presumably. So why would they be in the same uh, in the same locus? And this would offer an explanation. It's because the whole thing is collapsing. It, this is just these are just like the central part, central parts of a larger scale structure which is collapsing. And finally, just to end about the magnetic support. It's very interesting because what I just said about the, uh, the thermal support for the, uh, to give us the gene's length also applies for the magnetic support. Because uh, now let us, let us consider a spherical core which is threaded by, the, by a magnetic field. And let's just assume for the sake of discussion, this is actually not very uh, physically correct because uh, uh, this, uh, in particular, we are not making sure that the, the, the magnetic field uh, uh, satisfies the Maxwell's equations, for example. But we normally tend to say that the magnetic field scales like the density to some power. So let's just uh, take this sort of observationally inspired uh, scaling and together with our density profile, the star standard density profile. Then what you can do is work out the mass to flux ratio and find that it scales like this. It scales like r to the one minus p times one minus beta, where beta is the exponent of the magnetic field density scaling. So what this means is this, that if beta is larger than this quantity, than one minus one over p, then n over phi, n over phi decreases inwards, right? It's not constant. So uh, inner regions also, uh, the inner regions even of magnetically supercritical uh, clouds may appear magnetically subcritical. Mm -hmm. That is, the mass to flux ratio is not a, really a constant. Uh -huh. To us, in our minds, it's more like a boundary condition. If you just take these two scalings, 
then and try to determine the mass to flux ratio of any cordial measure, you will find that it depends on the radius at which you, tr you truncate your core. It's not a constant. Uh -huh. it's nor it is a constant if you consider a core of fixed mass that cannot accrete mass. Uh -huh. But if you consider a continuum and you draw boundaries at different radii, every radius will have a different value of the mass to flux ratio. And in particular, for this condition here, the, uh, the mass to flux ratio will decrease towards the center. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is consistent with uh, the result by, uh, by Dick Crutcher and his collaborators, collaborators in 2009, where they did look at the variation of the mass to flux ratio between a central core and its envelopes. Of course, and they did find that these R's are essentially the ratio of the core uh, mass to flux ratio to the envelope mass to flux ratio. And, uh, and this is a similar one. They indeed find, found that this is smaller than one, although here the uncertainties are so large that it's ridiculous. Here it's comparable, and this is probably the only value that might be uh, credible. So more measurements are needed because I, 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 people normally report the mass to flux ratio as a single quantity for the course. But actually, what we believe is we should be reporting the, the, the run of the mass to flux ratio with radius. Mm -hmm. And with that, I reach my conclusions. The inside out collapse uh, is a valid mathematical solution, but we believe it's impossible to occur in nature mm -hmm. because uh, it starts from a singular isothermal sphere, which cannot occur in nature. It's, it's a completely unstable uh, uh, solution. The, the physical solution seems to require dynamical collapse since the pre-stellar stage. And the impulse speed uh, during the pre-stellar stage uh, decreases towards the center in the flat density part of the collapse. Uh, I didn't mention this, but it, this might also offer an explanation to the observed transition to coherence that Alisa Goodman and her collaborators are, uh, are promote, have been promoting for decades, but uh, interpreted as a run of the impulse speed towards the center, but that uh, is still in the works. Um, the mean density profile during the pre-stellar stage approaches R to the minus two, and the binary bird light profile does not imply hydrostatic equilibrium. Uh, an R to the minus two profile does not require a, a, a quasi-static previous contraction to establish itself. It can occur uh, dynamically. And at slope equal of minus two, all the mass that enters the core goes to the stars. But uh, for shallower slopes, the material sort of chokes in the core, and so the core can grow in mass. The central parts uh, of even uh, large-scale supergenes or magnetically supercritical cores will always appear subgenes and magnetically subcritical, and they're in the process of being crushed by the ram pressure of the, of the infalling material, not collapsing by their own self-gravity. Uh, so what this means is that when we look at, an, at a structure that appears stable, in order to make sure that it's just truly in equilibrium, we need to look at its surroundings. Mm -hmm. And a final thought is that the mass to flux ratio does depend on radius, radius and it's not a fundamental intrinsic property of clouds and cores. It's more like a boundary condition. It depends on where you set your boundary. And with that, I finish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Enrique. So for the questions, uh, we'll start with the audience uh, in the auditorium. But uh, in the meantime, let's see some hands on the Zoom as well. Uh, Rosa, go ahead. Hi, Enrique. That's, that's all very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it's better to understand than to not understand. <laughs> are there any practical consequences for comparison to the simulation? Uh, yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. In fact, I was just looking at the review of magnetic fields for Pearl Stars and Planet 7. and Again, people are still, for example, reporting mass to flux ratios as a single value, as a property of the core. But uh, when, when you consider this, you realize that looking at finding a subcritical value of the mass to flux ratio does not guarantee that your core is hydrostatic. So uh, we should not divide the cores as, uh, as magnetically support, supported or not just by measuring a single value of, of the mass to flux ratio. Instead, in order to determine whether a core is supported or not, we should look at its environment and see if there's any trend of the mass to flux ratio increasing, because in that case, 
your core may not be hydrostatic. Your core it may actually be in the process of collapse. And so we're it's like we are interpreting it wrong. You know? um, the you actually uh, in, at the EPOS conference where I was a few weeks ago, some uh, Mario Tafaya made this very similar question. Okay, he talked about the alpha parameter, the the virial parameter, and he said, okay, I understand that the virial parameter doesn't measure things. Uh, it doesn't tell me whether a cloud is really supported or not supported, assembling or not supplanted, or pressure confined or not. First of all, I think we should really get rid of the idea of pressure confinement, because that has only been introduced to, to create a hydrostatic, a, to make possible a hydrostatic equilibrium. But things don't have to be in equilibrium. So they can be collapsing and they, they can be dispersing. And so there, the alpha parameter is something similar. It's also ratio of energies. We're working on that, but uh, we believe that uh, a similar explanation or, or a similar interpretation to this one can help us understand the trend of the virial parameter with mass or with radius in cores that is observed. And that so far has not received a full explanation. The, the, the virial parameter, for example, decreases with increasing mass of in, in any sample of course that you work on, so. And, uh, but there's no explanation. There's only one proposed explanation, which is observational, uh, because this is by Patrick and Abel and, um, ah, Traficante. <laughs> I should not forget his name. And uh, they claim that because you uh, measure the mass normally with dust measurements and, and the velocity dispersion with, with line measurements, that you're not sampling the same part of the, of, of the gas. That's fine, but it cannot be the only explanation because we also see, in, see it in the simulations and measure it directly without any synthetic observation. So there has to be something physical. And if it's something like this, it, it would work out in the same direction, except that uh, here what's involved is the turbulence or the velocity dispersion. So we're still on the works, but it might. So our message is that in order to determine stability, we should not look at single values of the quantities, but we should look at trends with scale. You know, for example, so report uh, the run of the mass to flux ratio with radius or, or of the genes length with radius or the alpha parameter with radius, that kind of thing. So that might be a better indication of stability or instability. Thanks, Rosa. Do we have any other questions in the auditorium? Okay, if not, uh, Javier has a question. Javier, go ahead. Yeah, so let's see, I think, okay. So um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, well, one, one of them is uh, regarding this, uh, uh, your point of, uh, of the VR parameter against mass. Um, the, the, the author that you didn't remember is Alessio Traficante. That's, yeah. he's, he's the first author, actually. So, and I believe that this, uh, in that case, uh, their, their argument is not, is, sorry? Yeah, yeah. no. Ah, okay. So, and the, the, the argument is not uh, completely valid because, because not all cores are, uh, the, the masses and the velocity dispersions are inferred in that way. So, uh, yes, the, that's true for that case, but there are also, uh, some samples in which the masses are inferred through lines, so yeah. they wouldn't, they, they don't necessarily disagree in volume. So that I don't think that that's the the actual explanation. The other point is regarding your line profiles. Can you go to the to the slide where you have the velocity profile? Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that you comment something like the central velocity in the line profile. Or, or no, the inferred velocity is subsonic because it comes from the densest part. Isn't it? Did, did you? I I can hear you properly, Enrique. Do you? Do you? I haven't said anything. <laughs> that's why. That's why you okay. can't hear me. Okay. So. Yeah. Uh, so what I said? No, it's not that the central part is that the peaks. Uh huh. Here. Mm -hmm. Come from uh, these peaks must come from material which is quite dense. Because, uh -huh. And uh, mm -hmm. so 
Uh, what I'm saying ju is just that uh, the highest velocities, for example, here, may be already a little bit uh, underweighted because they are not already at where the density is maximum. Yeah, okay. My, my point is the following. If I understand properly, you inferred smaller velocities from the line profile than from the... Yeah. Okay, so, so, yeah. So my only point is that you may you you may want to check that that it indeed comes from the densest part because even though the temperature excitation is larger and you will get more emission, the volume will be smaller. Mm -hmm. And then if if it's smaller, then you don't get enough enough emission so my my bet will be that rather the, of being from the very inside it might be from the external part where the velocity is decreasing that will be my bet but that's something to check that's the other estimation okay it might be okay okay uh -huh. okay thank you yeah uh, we'll check on that yeah, yeah. actually we're not totally sure of, about uh, what is the mechanism what we want to report is that there seems to be a systematic underestimation because that's what got me into this business in the first place, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, as I received the criticism that the that oh no, but the cores are not contracting at such high speeds and blah blah blah, and and, and this may offer an explanation, a solution. Yeah, to yeah, I, I agree, but I believe that it's because the external parts are also at lower velocities. Okay, it might and be. those uh, must dominate the emission because of volume. Yeah, okay. maybe what we need to do is not to commit ourselves too much to the interpretation and just report the result. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, start so, Javier, uh, or do you have another comment? No, 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 that's it. All right, thank you very much. Do we have any other uh, questions in the uh, Zoom uh, channel? Or anyone else in the auditorium have a comment? Okay, if not, let's thank Enrique again. Thank you very much. And we will see you next week. Thank you very much.